Imagine standing in a concrete pit. The air smells of burnt cordite and fear. Above you, the sky is black with American bombers. Around you, the ground is shaking from the impact of 500-pound bombs. You are holding the controls of the deadliest weapon of World War II. It is a masterpiece of engineering, capable of calculating calculus in seconds to snipe a plane from 25,000 feet. But here is the terrifying twist. You aren't a hardened veteran. You aren't even a fully trained soldier. You are 16 years old, and statistics say you have a 20% chance of surviving this war. Subscribe for more untold World War II stories. This is the story of the German 88, a weapon that was designed to do one thing, accidentally mastered another, and ultimately became the tomb for an entire generation of German youth. In the 1930s, German engineers at Krupp were given a mission. Build a gun that can shoot down the new high-altitude bombers. They created the Flugabwehr Kanona Achtzehn, or Flak Achtzehn. It was a beast. It fired an 88mm shell that weighed 20 pounds. It could launch this shell 26,000 feet into the air higher than Mount Everest. To do this, they gave it an insanely high muzzle velocity. But the engineers made a mistake. A brilliant, lethal mistake. They designed the gun so the barrel could be lowered completely horizontal. They didn't know it yet, but they hadn't just built an anti-aircraft gun. They had accidentally built the world's most terrifying sniper rifle for tanks. The legend of the 88 wasn't born in the sky. It was born in the mud of France in May 1940. During the Battle of Arras, heavily armored British Matilda tanks were crushing the German lines. The standard German anti-tank guns were useless. Their shells bounced off the British armor like ping-pong balls. The German infantry was panicking. The Blitzkrieg was about to fail. Then, a desperate commander made a forbidden decision. He ordered the flak crews to lower their barrels. Aim at the tanks! He screamed. The 88mm crews were terrified. They were trained to shoot at the sky, not at steel monsters charging at them from 500 yards away. But they pulled the trigger. The result was absolute carnage. The high-velocity shells, designed to fly 5 miles up, punched through the British tanks as if they were made of paper. They went through the front armor, through the engine block, and out the back. In minutes, the British counterattack was vaporized. At that moment, the 88 stopped being just a flak gun. It became the skeleton key of the Wehrmacht. If you had an 88, you could kill anything on Earth. But brute force was only half the story. The reason the 88 was so deadly wasn't just the metal. It was the math. This gun was part of the first smart weapon network in history. It used a device called the Commando Garat, a mechanical analog computer. Picture a box filled with gears, levers, and gyroscopes. A crew would look through rangefinders at a bomber formation. They would feed data into the computer. Wind speed, air density, target velocity. The computer would physically grind the gears and spit out a firing solution. It would tell the guns exactly where to aim, and crucially, exactly when the fuse should detonate. It sent this data electrically to the whole battery. When the command, fire, was given, four guns would shoot simultaneously. The shells would travel for 20 seconds, reaching a specific point in empty space. And at that exact millisecond, the bombers would arrive at that same point. It was clockwork death. American pilots called the black puffs of exploding 88 shells the Black Death. They feared it more than the German fighter planes, because you couldn't fight the math. So, if this weapon was so perfect, why did four out of five crew members die? The answer lies in the brutal logic of total war. The 88 was a victim of its own success. Because it was the most dangerous weapon on the battlefield, it became the number one priority target for the Allies. By 1944, the Americans and British weren't just bombing factories, they were hunting the hunters. They developed flak suppression tactics. Before the heavy bombers arrived, swarms of P-47 Thunderbolts and Typhoons would dive down on the flak pits. Imagine being in that pit. You are stationary, you cannot move, you are surrounded by sandbags, and a fighter plane is diving at you at 400 miles per hour firing eight machine guns and rockets directly into your face. The flak crews had to make a choice. Keep aiming at the bombers high above, or try to defend themselves against the fighters diving low. 
If they stopped shooting at the bombers, the cities would burn. If they ignored the fighters, they would die. Most of the time, they died. And this brings us to the most tragic outlier of the 80s story. By late 1944, Germany was running out of men. The veterans who had learned to use these guns in France and Russia were dead or captured. Who replaced them? Children. They were called Luftwaffenhelfer. High school students, aged 15, 16, and 17. Entire classrooms were drafted, put in uniforms, and stationed at the massive flak towers in Berlin, Hamburg, and Vienna. Helga Zimmermann, who served on a flak tower in Hamburg, recalled, The boys came to us so young. I was 19 and I felt like a mother to them. We had to teach them not just how to load a 20-pound shell, but how not to cry when the concrete shook from the bombs. Think about the psychological horror. A 16-year-old boy, hands shaking, trying to operate a complex analog computer while the world burns around him. He isn't fighting for ideology anymore. He is fighting because if he leaves his post, he will be shot by his own officers. If he stays, he will likely be blown up by an American bomb. The 88 was so effective that the Germans eventually stopped pretending it was just an anti-aircraft gun. They modified it and put it inside the most feared tank of the war, the Tiger I. The Tiger's main gun was essentially an 88. This is why Allied tank crews reported seeing their friends' tanks explode from two miles away. They never heard the shot. The shell traveled faster than the speed of sound. You were dead before you heard the bang. But mounting it on a tank didn't save the crews. In the final months of the war, as the Russians stormed Berlin, the 88 crews lowered their barrels for the last time. They dragged these massive guns into the streets. Klaus Weber, a 16-year-old gunner, wrote in his final letter, The Russians are two blocks away. We have turned the 88 toward the street. We will fire until the shells run out. Then we use our rifles. Klaus never sent that letter. He died beside his gun, like thousands of others. The German 88 changed warfare forever. It proved that a single weapon could dominate the land and the sky. It paved the way for modern missile systems and integrated fire control. But when we look at the black and white footage of those massive guns recoiling, we shouldn't just see a machine. We should see the tragedy hidden in the smoke. We should see a weapon that was too good for its own good. A weapon that demanded such a high price from its operators that it consumed an entire generation. Four out of five. That is 80%. They were the masters of the sky and the ground, but in the end, they were sitting ducks in concrete pits, waiting for the inevitable. The 88mm gun didn't just punch holes in B-17 bombers, it punched a hole in the future of a nation, leaving behind a legacy of brilliant engineering and wasted youth. If you want to understand the true cost of war, look past the generals in the maps. Look at the 16-year-old kid spinning the fuse dial on an 88, knowing that the math is no longer in his favor. If this story of technology and tragedy moved you, hit that like button. It helps us keep these forgotten histories alive. And tell me in the comments, was the 88 a triumph of engineering or a symbol of desperation? Subscribe for more stories from the edge of history.